the key issue here is really the influence of Mueller. And they were looking at the effects of ionizing radiation on, on fruit fly germ cells. They didn't do low dose research. They're low dose. They're zapping fruit flies with x-rays to see what mutations occur, right? Well, their lowest dose was like 100 to 1,000 x-rays. That's not a low dose. X-rays today are pretty mild. But in 1946, you had to expose film, not a silicon chip. 1,000 x-rays is what they were doing in three and a half minutes. Imagine if you sat through 1,000 1946 x-rays in three and a half minutes. Despite his experiments having a very limited range of uh, strengths of radiation that the fruit flies were exposed to, he extrapolated down to zero radiation in a way that is called the linear no threshold, meaning that there is damage done to organisms no matter how little the radiation is until you reach no radiation. It's based on the assumption that radiation will harm you at whatever degree to whatever degree you're exposed. It is established in regulation, yet there is no epidemiological data to back that up. There is no study that says we have taken a cohort of people and we've exposed them to 1% more radiation than normally would get and we've seen 1% more cancer. In fact, there are many places in the world where background levels of radiation are substantially higher than they are for regular places. If the linear no threshold hypothesis was in fact true or even approaching truth, you would see statistically significantly higher levels of cancer in those populations, those cohorts. But what happens? Not only is there not higher levels of cancer, there are actually suppressed levels of cancer. Kasperi found no support for the linear model, but actually found support for a threshold. And this was in a very large study with the most sophisticated advancements in, in methodology, and also at by far the lowest dose rate that had ever been tested. So it was, at that point, the best test for a low dose effect. Kasperi dug in. And Kasperi wanted to see, well, was he right or was he wrong? And so Kasperi dug deep into the literature. He actually got much unpublished data from Mueller himself. Well, Mueller writes back on November 12th. This is the smoking gun. He writes back on November 12th and said he got it. He kind of scanned the whole thing. He looked at it. He saw the data. The data actually conflicted with this, uh, his uh, linear paradigm. It was very disturbing. The study has to be replicated. He can't, uh, he can't challenge the work because Kasperi was a very good scientist. He laid out that he knew uh, the story. And he had been a consultant all the way through as well. He knew the implications. He knew that it was the best study to date. But what did he do? He just threw it under the bus. He was asked to uh, give testimony to the National Academy of Sciences uh, regarding the effects of radiation. He basically makes the claim that one can no longer accept um, um, the belief that there is a threshold relationship. He says that, you know, we have to accept a linear perspective. Now, you can call that lying, you can call that mis mischievous, you can call it anything you want, but it wasn't being honest. We know the linear no threshold hypothesis is not true, living organisms have repair mechanisms that make up for both chemical and radiological damage. The notion there's no safe amount of radiation, that is not a substantiated or even an accurate statement. It is probably actually utterly inaccurate, but it is commonly found as the basis of public policy around the world. The linear no threshold hypothesis came from a point in time when we really didn't know much about radiation, we didn't know much about cell behavior internally, and we didn't know very much at all about how cancer occurs. In the original Kasperi study, Kasperi concluded that there was um, a likely threshold, a tolerance for radiation. And Muller's name was not on there. When it was ultimately published um, in 1948, um, the conclusion removed a, a single sentence, and that was a sentence that there was uh, likely a threshold of tolerance, and the only thing that it added was the name of Mueller as a consultant. And so it's very, very interesting. No data were changed. It was the only changes that were made. Removal of, of uh, the threshold conclusion, addition of Mueller as a consultant. Basic dose response for risk assessment was 
altered from a threshold to linearity. It's born of a history of deception and fraud and ideological uh, uh, manipulation. If you believe LNT, then any little bit of radiation poses a threat to you. You'd also want to evacuate all states like Colorado, you know, anywhere that's high up or has large background levels of radiation. Well, we're constantly bathed by radiation all our lives, and our cells are capable of repairing one radiation damage event per second per cell. What you have to take a look at is the amount of radiation you absorb over how much time. If you get it all at once, yeah, you'll die, or yeah, you'll get cancer, or yeah, you'll get a sunburn or a melanoma, but you get a little bit every day, and that's, that's actually fine. We just do not have any evidence that below about 10% of what will kill you, which is a lot of radiation, that there's really any ill effects. There's countless places in the world that are far more radioactive than, than outside the gates at Fukushima. So many people died or suffered from that mass evacuation that is pretty much needless. Even the worst case nuclear accidents of complete meltdown, it still gets very hard for us to kill people. Who gets more radiation, a airline pilot or a nuclear submarine commander? And most people, of course, choose the nuclear submarine commander. Why? That reactor is right next to them. Well, the reality is the reactor is well shielded and because they're underwater, they're not getting radiation from space because space is where we get much of our radiation. So the pilot is actually getting much more radiation than the crew or captain of the nuclear submarine. Right now I'm being irradiated, about half of it's coming from the sky because space is radioactive. This substance I'm standing on is radioactive. This church behind me made out of stone is probably radioactive stone. Um, and I had uh, fruit for this morning. There's radioactive potassium in there. My body needs it, but it's radioactive. It, it's really what we, we have to focus the debate on is, is learning and understanding this, I have to say, the irrational fear of nuclear power because short of Chernobyl, if you look at the scientific literature, they had hundreds of thousands of people that got a lot of radiation getting close to that 10 percent they can't seem to find excess cancers in those um, even if you use that kind of discredited linear no threshold uh, they would estimate three i believe it's three to four thousand deaths worldwide now that is a disaster but if that's the one disaster we've had in in decades of nuclear power compared to dam bursts or natural gas explosions all these other things i mean come on people it's it's look at this rationally. That's all we're asking you to do. When I really had a hard look at nuclear power, what I saw staring back at me were my own prejudices, my own biases, my blocks, my ignorance, and my indoctrination. I worked at Friends of the Earth, who, you know, a green campaign group in the UK, and I was an anti-nuclear campaigner. And so, you know, over time, my, my objection to nuclear has kind of fallen away as I've got to know different aspects of it. Ted and I were raised in the anti-nuclear movement, went to anti-nuclear rallies throughout our childhoods, were anti-nuclear until we were forced to actually understand the, the, non, the low carbon technological options we have. I thought nuclear power was dumb. I had no interest in it. You know, I was like, oh, old junk. I was very, very opposed to nuclear power with no information whatsoever. And I was asked to teach a course on it. And in the process of teaching a course, I changed my mind. Most people do not change their mind when they are confronted with information that is contrary to their preconceptions. People generally make decisions emotionally rather than logically. You make your decision whether or not you like nuclear power and then you rationalize it. Exactly. You make your decision and then you go and you are interested in data that supports your decision and you're uninterested in data that doesn't. Germany did a, a classic study of children under the age of five living less than 5k kilometers from 16 reactors. Their incidence of leukemia was more than double normal. That study was then duplicated by the French. So they don't need to do another study. The first one looked at leukemia rates among German children living within a five kilometer radius of any operating nuclear reactor where 17 incidents of leukemia would have been expected, researchers instead found 37 cases. 
The second study looked at leukemia rates among French children living within five kilometers of any operating nuclear reactor. Where seven cases of leukemia would have been expected, researchers instead found 14 cases. In both studies, childhood leukemia rates near reactors are doubled. Also, in both studies, researchers strongly cautioned against attributing the increase in leukemia to any radioactive emission from the reactors. How could the researchers involved in both studies see a doubling of leukemia rates near reactors and then argue against blaming reactor emissions as the cause? Wouldn't anyone like to know? And those two studies are classic studies. They don't need to do any more studies. QED. It's proven. No, it is not that interesting to everybody. Both the French and German studies measured leukemia rates against distance from nuclear power plants and found almost identical results. The French study followed the German one and so attempted to address confounding factors that the German study did not. The French study used two geographic models. One was simply distance to the reactor, as the German study had done. The second incorporated wind direction to more closely model where any radioactive emissions from the reactor would be distributed. The excess cases of leukemia disappeared when using this more accurate weather model, meaning the vast majority of leukemia cases were not downwind from the reactors as one might expect when trying to associate leukemia with reactor emission. This curious finding was then explored further in a UK study which saw elevated leukemia rates where nuclear power plants were planned but had not been constructed. Nuclear power plants may be located close to cities and large population centers, but they're not dropped in the middle of housing units. Most frequently in Europe, they're found in small industrial towns. They're typically built near factories, populated with blue-collar workers, possibly on land already saturated with chemicals from the previous industrial occupant. The vast majority of scientific research finds no increase in cancer or leukemia. Note again, researchers of both the German and French leukemia studies cautioned against presuming nuclear power plant emission was the cause. So what does Caldecott do? cite the reports as evidence of just that. That's a classic study and that's because reactors continually emit tritium. You can't operate a reactor without tritium. George Mombayot once deferred to Caldecott on matters of nuclear power and radiation. In 2011, shortly after the Fukushima disaster and a discussion with Caldecott on Democracy Now! This is the biggest medical to conspiracy and cover-up in, cover cover in the history radiation. of medicine, George. He wrote, The anti-nuclear movement to which I once belonged has misled the world about the impacts of radiation on human health. The claims we have made are ungrounded in science, unsupportable when challenged, and wildly wrong. We have done other people and ourselves a terrible disservice. Helen Caldicott, the world's foremost anti-nuclear campaigner, made some striking statements about the dangers of radiation. I asked for the sources. Caldicott's response has profoundly shaken me. None were scientific publications. None contained sources for the claims she made.